welcome to this Upgrade Your Sound product showcase. My name is Kurt Witt with Music and Arts. I'm really excited to spend some time talking about the world-renowned Buffet Clarinet line. We have a special guest joining us from Buffet, Clarinet product manager, Matt Vance. Matt is here to discuss a couple of key models, share some unique insights into what makes Buffet Clarinet special, and of course, answer any questions that might come along during the presentation. You can see some of the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. So at any point during the presentation, if you've got some questions, uh, feel free to post them and somebody will be available to answer that either in the chat or live. During this product showcase, I also have a couple of polls that I'll launch and get some feedback from the audience on a couple different subjects and get to hear the expert opinion of our expert panelist, Matt Vance, on those subjects as well. Uh, buffet clarinets have long been the first choice for professionals, teachers, advancing students alike. Uh, we're going to dive into three particular models in depth and hear why buffet is a great choice for that advancing clarinet player looking to upgrade to a better instrument. So welcome to Matt and take it away. Hey, good evening, Kurt. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone that's uh, joining us this evening. Uh, or as I prefer to uh, call it, the Buffet Crampon Friday Happy Hour discussing clarinets this evening. So uh, glad you're joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to talk about the three models that we're going to focus on tonight. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about Buffet Crampon clarinets, if you're not familiar with the line or maybe you, you don't know too much about it, um, it's arguably the most renowned clarinet manufacturer in the world. Buffet Crampon has been around since 1825, and the company is headquartered in a, in a town outside of Paris, France called Montleville. And we have uh, production facilities all around the world, but the professional clarinets are made at that factory in Montleville. And then the uh, semi-professional, intermediate, and student clarinets are made at our facility in Martin Kirschen, Germany. So we'll talk about uh, the three models that we have here and we'll talk about the features, we'll talk about where they're made and we'll talk about some of the other uh, uh, usage of the instruments and uh, how these three models differ. So Kurt, if it's okay with you, I will start by talking about the legendary choice of professionals, the R13 clarinet. Um, so the R13 is the instrument that I have here. So when I say the legendary choice of professionals, the reason I say that is because this instrument is played by 80 to 90% of all professional clarinetists in the world. We're talking globally, this is the most popular professional clarinet and there are a lot of different reasons why. Uh, I think the most important thing to talk about first is the innovation behind this particular instrument because the R13, is actually the basis for the modern clarinet sound and modern clarinet design. The R13 features what's called a polycylindrical bore. What does that mean? When we talk about a polycylindrical bore, we're talking about essentially two cylinders. And that was something that had never been done before with clarinet design. Up to that point, we were talking about cylindrical bore design. So when we talk about the polycylindrical bore and we're talking about the inner bore, we're talking about the tube on the inside of the clarinet, we're talking about two cylinders, essentially a cylinder in the upper joint and a cylinder in the lower joint. And this was something that was pioneered in 1955 by a legendary acoustician at Buffet Crampon. His name was Robert Carre or Robert Carre. And he came up with the idea for the polycylindrical bore. This bore design is now the basis of clarinet design, not only for all Buffet Crampon clarinet models, uh, it's also the basis of design for clarinet models from other manufacturers as well. So it really took hold in 1955 and gave uh, rise to what a lot of people uh, refer to as the Buffet Crampon ring to the sound that we talk about. Um, I think it would be interesting for us to talk about the key plating of this instrument as well, because the R13 is unique in the clarinet world in that it is available with two different key plating options. Uh, the one that I have here that I'm showing you now and that I'll play for you in just a second, this has nickel plated keywork. You can also get this clarinet with silver plated keywork, as you can see on these other two instruments that have silver plated keys. 
What's the difference? Why do we have those two options available? Well, there are a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of them has to do with acoustics and vibration. When we talk about a clarinet, or really we talk about any musical instrument, we talk about the instrument vibrating or resonating when we put air through the horn. And everything involved in the design, uh, in the design of a clarinet or any musical instrument will have an effect on the resonance and the vibration of the instrument. When we talk about nickel plated keys versus silver plated keys, those two plating materials are going to give a different resonance and a different vibration. And a player may prefer one over the other. We have a lot of our artists that prefer nickel plated keys over silver plated keys and vice versa. Um, another thing that you'll find with the key plating on the R13 is the feel of the instrument. Uh, some people prefer how the nickel plating feels to their key, uh, to, their, to their fingertips uh, over one over the other. So that's also a personal preference thing. There's also a skin acidity thing. Uh, there's an element to where uh, if someone has acidic skin, it can react with one of the platings more than the other. So that's something to consider when you're looking at a potential purchase of an R13 clarinet. Now, as Kurt and I were laughing about on the uh, preview to the show, I'm primarily a saxophone player. I double on clarinet. And um, I'm not going to sound anything like what uh, Felix Pikeley sounded like on our preview, but I am going to play a little bit because I think it's important that we discuss how you try instruments and the method that you go through, because there is a method to so, uh, selecting a clarinet or really selecting any musical instrument to make sure that you're getting the right instrument for you. So what I'm gonna do with this R13 clarinet is I'm going to play a scale for you and we're gonna listen to the evenness, we're gonna listen to the tone quality and we're going to listen to the internal intonation, meaning the, uh, the instrument and how it plays in tune with itself. And then I also might play a little melodic excerpt that uh, gives me an idea of the, of the flexibility of the instrument. So let's start out with just an F major scale. This is a concert E flat scale, and I'm going to play it three octaves. I picked this scale because of the ability to play three octaves. This will give me a good idea of the sound and the response in the low register, in the medium register, and up into the altissimo register. So here we go. So while I was playing that scale, I was paying attention to a lot of different things. I was trying to listen to the sound quality. Does the sound and the tone quality of the clarinet, is it consistent from register to register? I'm also paying attention to the tuning of the instrument. Does it play in tune with itself? And I'm also paying attention to the resistance of the instrument and, and how the instrument blows. Is it more resistant in one particular register than the other? Because we want a, an instrument that is gonna play as evenly as possible. So these are all things that I'm thinking about and listening to and paying attention to while I'm playing this particular scale. So Matt, is it, is it important to have a, a couple of other people maybe listening to you at the same time? Because your perception in your space is one thing, but what somebody might hear standing six feet in front of you could be an entirely different thing. And that's important, isn't it? To hear that feedback too. Kurt, that's a great point. It is very, very important when you are selecting an instrument that you have an objective set of ears listening, if at all possible. It can be your clarinet teacher, it can be your band director, it can be a music teacher, or someone even with just very good refined ears. Because as Kurt correctly pointed out, what you're hearing when you're playing the instrument is completely different from the sound that someone is getting from six feet away, or the sound that someone is getting at the back of a concert hall. So I think that's a terrific point, Kurt, that you wanna have someone that is gonna give you objective feedback of the instrument where they're actually in front of the instrument and they're able to listen to the sound quality and the projection and all those acoustic qualities. Yeah, Matt, of the things that you pointed out, the, the evenness of tone and the intonation, that is really 
that's something that a premium handcrafted instrument like the R13 should really excel at. The tone from low register to high register is going to be very consistent and the, the evenness of tone from note to note is going to be very consistent. Is that one of the things that you're listening for? And one of the things that's the hallmark of that instrument? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that, that people often forget when we're talking about an R13 or any wood clarinet is the fact that this is an instrument made out of African blackwood. And it's a material that varies and changes as the instrument is played. So I think it's a good idea when you are selecting a new clarinet for yourself. If you're able to play a couple or two or three or four of the same model so you can you can compare them. Because I'll tell you that if you had two or three R13s lined up next to each other, they're all gonna play a little bit differently. And that's the beauty of the clarinet actually. That's a good thing because each instrument is going to offer you different uh, qualities as far as the sound and the response. And one might be better suited for a player than the other. And one might offer a sound that a player prefers over the other. So I think that's a really good point that, that there's a lot of handcrafting in this instrument, but there's also a lot of personality in this instrument too. For many students stepping up to a wood clarinet as their you know, next step above a student instrument, there could also be a little extra care and maintenance to that wood clarinet because it, it might take a little extra uh, a little extra care and feeding of sorts. Talk, talk to us a little bit, Matt, about what is involved with the care and maintenance of a wood clarinet. Definitely. Um, most of our, our beginning clarinetists start out on plastic clarinets. Uh, if you start out on a buffet, uh, buffet grand pomme for each clarinet, you're going to have leather pads, you're going to have ABS plastic, and you're going to have nickel plated keys. When you move up to a wood clarinet, um, there are a lot of things to consider and a lot of positive aspects of moving up to that instrument that's made out of the African blackwood or impingo wood, grenadilla wood. Those are all names for basically the same thing. Um, as Kurt pointed out, there is a lot to consider when it comes to care of the instrument. Because this is made out of African blackwood, we have to make sure that we maintain the humidity level of the instrument and maintain the moisture level of the instrument and keep it as consistent as possible because this is an organic material. This is a porous material that changes as the material heats up, as it gets moisture, it's gonna change, it's gonna flex, it's gonna swell and it's gonna retract. And I think that's something that surprises a lot of people when they move up to a wood clarinet is the fact that the instrument does change and there is a break-in period. Um, I think one of the things that is very, very important when you move up to a wood clarinet is to make sure that you swab the instrument regularly. That is very, very important. I can't overemphasize the importance of that because you want to make sure that you're getting that moisture out of the inner bore as much as possible. The reason that people have problems with wood instruments, whether it's a clarinet or an oboe, is the fact that the wood is getting... Uh, moisture and then it's drying out. It's heating up and then it's cooling off. And so the wood is changing when it does that. And wood doesn't like to do that. Wood likes to have consistency. So if we can make sure that we keep that moisture level and that temperature level as consistent as possible by regularly swabbing out the instrument, that really is going to help the longevity of the clarinet in the long run. I'd say every, every 15 to 20 minutes, it's a good idea to swab out the clarinet when you're practicing. So it just really, it sounds like what you're saying, it takes a, just a little bit more attention to the instrument, maybe not unlike a car. As you get a, a nicer car, it needs regular oil changes, it needs uh, regular maintenance, and your, your R13 and other wood models uh, you know, needing the same thing. I have one quick additional question about the silver versus nickel keys before you move on to the next instrument. Um, it It's a you know, it's a pretty dramatic difference visually between the nickel and silver. And a lot of people would think that the shinier silver would be a higher quality material than the little bit more dull uh, kind of grayish nickel. Do, do players sometimes have to overcome what they see with their eyes and listen with their ears to really decide what's the right thing for them? Is that a challenge? That's a great question. And it is a challenge. Yes. Um, the perception is if something is 
made out of a more precious material or plated in a more precious material, which often can psychologically make you think it's more expensive or better, then uh, they're drawn to that material. But really, and I, I emphasize this a lot when I'm talking to young players, it is really a personal preference thing. One is not better than the other. It really is what works best for you. For a lot of players, the nickel plated key work works better. They like the feel of it. They like the resonance and the acoustic properties of it. And then there are other players that prefer the silver plated keys for the same reasons for them. So just because uh, you have a clarinet that's nickel plated versus silver plated, one is not better than the other. It really is a personal preference thing. Yeah, makes complete sense. And so as you're uh, going to maybe grab the next one, I'm going to launch a quick poll here about uh, uh, our what might be your favorite style of music. And we can talk, uh, once we get back some uh, responses, Matt, maybe after this one, we can talk a little bit about the versatility uh, of these instruments and how versatile they are for multiple things. Because today's clarinet player, as they're stepping up uh, in middle school or high school, has to do a lot of different things. You're playing in concert band, you might be playing in the orchestra, you might be playing in the pit orchestra, you might be playing in a jazz combo or a Dixieland combo, and that versatility is important. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that in uh, in just a few minutes. That sounds great. Uh, Kurt, what's your favorite style of clarinet music? I'm curious. Um, you know what? I think there's something special about jazz clarinet. Uh, Felix Pikely, um, for those of you who turned in er tuned in early, we heard a little bit of a pre- uh, showcase music from uh, one of my favorite jazz clarinetists, Felix Pikeley. If you've not heard of him, uh, go to kingclarinet.com. And there's something smooth and kind of uh, mellow about the clarinet sound in the jazz tradition. And I think it's a, it's a level of virtuosity in the, the, the scales and the patterns that uh, is just so smooth and so even. So that's my favorite. Um, but I'm a little biased because I, I really think Felix is playing is unbelievable. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people forget that clarinet is uh, a really viable jazz instrument. I think a lot of people associate saxophone with jazz and they forget that in, you know, the days of Dixieland jazz, the clarinet was one of the primary instruments. And uh, maybe we can demonstrate the versatility of, of this clarinet here in just a second. So I'm curious to see what the what the viewers are going to vote as far as what their favorite style. Absolutely. Is. Well, tell tell us a little bit about the the next horn that you've got. Okay. So the next clarinet that we have here is the E12F. So the E12F is considered a semi-professional clarinet. Um, this is African blackwood, like the R13, but visually, and I don't know if you can make it out on the camera or not. This has unstained African blackwood. When we were talking about the R13, I failed to mention that the R13 has stained African blackwood. This has unstained African blackwood. And a lot of people are surprised when they look at this instrument at the beauty of the wood grain. It's, it's almost a brownish reddish uh, hue to the wood grain. It's really very, very attractive when you look at it up close. And uh, one of the reasons we did that was to differentiate it from the R13. The R13 uh, is a black clarinet. And a lot of people were surprised to find out that the way that instrument is, is made to appear black is actually a purple dye. Well, we don't use that on the E12F because we really like the acoustic or the, uh, the aesthetic beauty of the unstained African blackwood. Um, if you compare this instrument to the R13 visually, in addition to the uh, difference in the wood appearance, you can see that this instrument has silver plated keys. The E12F comes with silver plated keys. And another big difference with this instrument compared to the R13 are the pads. The pads on the E12F are actually leather pads. And when we talk about the R13, that utilizes double fish skin pads. Is one better than the other? No, it really, again, is an acoustic preference in terms of what kind of, what kind of sound you're looking for. Um, the leather pads on the E12F are actually the same pads that we find on some of our, our other clarinets, like the Prodige student clarinet, and some of the higher end clarinets, like the Tradition clarinet. Um, why people like leather pads, in addition to the uh, maybe acoustic preference, is the fact that leather pads are very durable. So when we're talking about uh, a semi-professional instrument that is a significant step up uh, from a student clarinet, 
you have the security of knowing that the pads are going to hold up very well over time and they're going to give a good seal as well. But it will also give you a little bit of a different sound too. And we were talking earlier about using something when you're trying out an instrument uh, that you feel comfortable with. It's also important when you're comparing clarinets or any instrument that you pick an excerpt or a scale that you're comfortable with, but that you're also going to play on each instrument you try. Why do you want to do that? Because you want a common frame of reference. You want to be able to hear the same thing on every instrument that you play so you can compare them apples to apples. So if we're going to do that, why don't we take that same scale that I played on the R13, the F major scale, which is concert E flat, and let's see if it sounds a little bit different and it responds a little bit different on this instrument. <laughs> tell over computer or iPhone speakers and, and with a, a webcast mic, but for me that felt quite a bit different from the R13. Um, the, the evenness was different. It wasn't better or worse, it was just different. It was a different blow for me as far as putting air into the instrument and as far as the tuning of the instrument, but it felt very fam uh, familiar and similar to the R13 in a lot of ways, and one of the reasons that is is that when we referenced the polycylindrical bore earlier in the webcast, um, this instrument utilizes the same bore design as the R13. The big difference is that this bore is slightly larger than what we find on the R13. Why is that significant? Well, there are a couple of different reasons. Number one, if you have a slightly larger bore, what is that going to do to the resistance of the instrument? It's going to make it a little less resistant, a little freer blowing, which can be appealing to younger players or saxophonists like me that prefer something that has a little less resistance. Uh, the R13 has a slightly smaller bore, so it's going to give you more resistance and it's going to make the sound a little more focused and uh, possibly a projection as well. So um, the E12F is a phenomenal uh, intermediate semi-professional clarinet. It offers a lot of the features of the R13. The key work is almost identical to the R13 uh, with the unstained African blackwood and the leather pads and the silver plated keys. It also comes in a really cool backpack style case. Uh, I think it's a really terrific option for someone that's maybe not quite ready to jump up to the price bracket of the R13 professional clarinet. Matt, you, you mentioned a little bit about resistance, and I'm, I'm curious, that's a word that can, uh, can have a lot of different connotations for players. Re resistance to the clarinet player isn't good or bad, is it? You're just trying to find the balance of what feels good for you and that instrument. It's not more resistance isn't bad and less resistance isn't good. Is that, is that true? Yeah, absolutely, Kurt. Um, when we talk about resistance, uh, I think sometimes the word resistance has a negative connotation. When we're talking about it with musical instruments and specifically with clarinet, um, it's, it's just an aspect of how the instrument responds and how it plays. Again, it's not a good or a bad thing. And we get back to that personal preference thing. Some players prefer more resistance because they like to have something to push against with their air while other players prefer something that has less resistance so they're not having to work as hard to get a good sound on the instrument. So it's not a good or bad thing. Again, it's a personal preference thing and it's an aspect of playing the instrument. So Matt, I'm, I'm curious now of your opinion from our poll question. So kind of the, the resounding answer is people love all styles of music. And so <laughs> with the clarinet, and so would it be true to say that this, this E12F, which is a phenomenal instrument, is something that a high school student could play through their entire high school and even into college career, say they were going to uh, be not be a music major, but study something else, but want to continue making music. That instrument would be an incredibly versatile horn to take a player all the way through college, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Um, if, if you were looking at an instrument that you want to play through college, 
and even after you get out of college to where you're going to play for fun or you're going to play in a community wind ensemble because of the fact that it is an African blackwood instrument, that it's got the silver plated keys, that it has that polycylindrical bore that we find on the professional clarinets. Um, I, I really consider this instrument an incredible value because of the fact that it incorporates a lot of those professional features into a semi-professional budget as far as what you're putting into the instrument. And the fact that you can play all different styles of music. I mean, you can play something like Mozart. Or you can play Charlie Parker. Sorry, I fumbled a little bit on that, but you get the idea. You're able to play a lot of different styles on this instrument. It can handle all of them. So Matt, we had a good uh, good question from the uh, the audience about the uh, the mouthpiece and ligature that these come with, and so the. The R13 does not come with a mouthpiece, correct? Most play most players at that level will have their own mouthpiece, their own preference. There's no point in adding something, but the E12 will come with a, a mouthpiece and ligature, correct? Absolutely, yeah. With with the R13, uh, we used to include a mouthpiece, and frankly, nobody used it, or they used it as a doorstop, and they had their own setup that they already preferred. So what we did is we took the mouthpiece out and we put an upgraded ligature in the outfit. Uh, the E12F, however, has a terrific included mouthpiece with it. It was a mouthpiece that was designed for that instrument to be a quality mouthpiece in the outfit that you can put on the, on the clarinet right out of the box and play it and you're going to sound great and it's going to play really well for you. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's often undervalued what an impact that can make. Uh, the mouthpiece and ligature as part of the total value of the instrument, plus the case, the E12 uh, in a really nice case. So um, I have another question as you're, you're kind of getting the third horn ready. I think you've got the, uh, the Giardinelli there uh, by buffet ready to go. I'm curious as to your opinion, when is the right time for an advancing clarinet to consider stepping up to the next instrument, whether that's uh, an E12F or an R13, when, when is the right time that they should consider that? Well, I, th I think there are a lot of different factors, Kurt. I think, I think we have to consider seriousness of the player, uh, the commitment of the player, um, the commitment of the parents financially. Um, I, I think all of those things factor into it, but I think there's also a point where you reach a certain level of, of uh, ability an accomplishment on the instrument to where you're outgrowing the student clarinet that you started on the, the plastic clarinet. Um, I think most, most young players, when they upgrade to a wood, wood instrument, it's usually in high school. Uh, a lot of times they'll move up to something like the E12F or the Giardinelli clarinet because you're moving up to a wood clarinet but you're not making a substantial financial leap as far as from the student clarinet to something like the R13. Uh, I think the R13 clarinet, uh, as far as a, a move to that instrument, it's gonna be for someone that is looking at uh, possibly majoring in music as a performance major in college, or they really wanna have an instrument that they know is gonna be able to handle advanced literature. And I, I, think, I think it varies from, from player to player, but I think usually in high school and then going into college is when you really seriously consider getting on, on a semi-professional or a professional instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the third horn. So we've talked about the R13, the, the choice of professionals worldwide, the E12F, great uh, advancing student model, something that can carry a clarinetist through their uh, entire playing career, perhaps. And now you've got the, what's the third one that you have there? So this is the Giardinelli clarinet. This is an instrument that is exclusive to music and arts and to woodwind brasswind. And this is an instrument that I'm personally very excited about and I think is a fantastic value for music and arts and woodwind brasswind customers because it offers a lot of the same features of the previous model that we talked about, the E12F. Um, this has unstained African blackwood like the E12F, and it's got silver plated keys like the E12F. Um, 
I think when you play this instrument and you consider the price point and the value of the instrument, it really is a fantastic option for customers to check out. And let's, let's put this instrument to the same test that we did the other two and let's check it out and see what it sounds like. And what I can tell you right off the bat as I'm playing this scale is that it is extremely even. Uh, it's very free blowing, which I really like. Um, for a younger player that is moving up from a student clarinet, this is going to be a fantastic option because it offers a lot of those pro features, but it's also going to have a familiar feel to it from the student clarinet that they're advancing from. And um, I, I, I got to tell you, I love this instrument. I think it's a fantastic instrument. This is an instrument that we have here at Buffet Crampon USA in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I hadn't played this instrument before today, and I put my mouthpiece on it this afternoon when I was setting up for our webcast. And I played one scale and I went, wow, this is a really nice instrument. Um, it's, it's really a great value. And I encourage uh, your customers, if they're able to check one of these out in one of the retail locations, they should bring their mouthpiece and, and play it right away. It's really a terrific value. Another good uh, question, Matt, uh, back to, uh, you were talking about pads uh, between the R13 and the, the E12. And a uh, question from the audience about R13 pads. And is there a, a specific type of maybe aftermarket pad that could work well? Because many times players might find a used instrument or a hand, hand-me-down instrument that an older sibling had that needed some work. Uh, is there any, what do you recommend in, in that instance? Um, you know, I, Kurt, I don't really recommend a specific type of pad. We keep using the expression personal preference, but it really is a personal preference. There's so many different pad designs and materials that you can choose from. There's Gore-Tex, there's leather, there's double fish skin, which is the standard pad outfit on the R13. Um, you get into some of the other uh, uh, brands of pads, the synthetic pads. Um, I think all of the different pad materials and designs offer different things for the players in terms of durability, in terms of acoustic response and seal on the tone holes. I think those are all things that have to be considered. But the bottom line is you need to check them out on, the, on, on instruments that are already outfitted with them and see which one works best for you. And if you have a preferred technician that you like to work with, see what recommend, uh, recommendations that they have as well. That's a great question, though. Uh, I know that there are a number of, we, we've touched on these three models, the R13, the E12, F, and the, uh, the Giardinelli uh, by Buffet model. There are also a couple of other really popular Buffet models uh, that we're, we're not going to necessarily go into, but can you give us just a little bit of a highlights? The E11 is another really popular model, and you make a line uh, called the Green Line, which I think is really interesting that I'd like to hear just a little bit more about. Sure, sure. Well, let's talk about the E11. The E11 is, um, is a wood clarinet. It's considered a student clarinet, but a lot of people look at it as a step-up model because of the fact that it is made from African blackwood. The African blackwood used with the E11 is slightly less dense than what you're going to find on the semi-professional or the professional buffet crampon clarinets. Uh, it comes with nickel-plated keys, and it comes with double fish skin pads like what you're going to find on the R13. Uh, those clarinets are made in Germany, and they have been a workhorse for student and step-up clarinets for decades. Um, you'll find that a lot of the band programs in Texas actually start their kids out on the E11. So that's a great option. It's also uh, our entry-level wood clarinet in the Buffet Crampon hierarchy. So if you're looking to move up to a wood clarinet and maybe quite not, not quite ready to get into the Giardinelli or the E12F, that's a really good option. Um, as far as green line instruments go, green line is actually a material that you can got, get a lot of our different models in. Uh, the R13 comes in green line. You get into some of the, the higher end professional models like the Festival or the Tosca. They also have options to get those clarinets in green line material. And uh, I could talk for hours about what green line is, but it's an alternate material. It's 80 to 90% African blackwood combined with an epoxy resin. And the reason this is so uh, attractive to a lot of players is the fact 
that you have the acoustic properties of the wood, but it's very, very stable. So it's not going to change quite as much as an African blackwood instrument. And uh, it's going to be much more resistant to cracking and much more forgiving when it comes to temperature and humidity changes. So it, it's really a great option. It is important to remember that the, the wood clarinet is still an organic material at the end of the day. And it's a natural resource um, that has, um, you know, has controls put on it from the areas where it's harvested. What are some of the things um, that you guys are doing to help protect that supply of African blackwood so that in a hundred years, when that generation of clarinet players is ready for their R13, there'll still be a, a stable and steady supply of that product. Well, it, it, Kurt, it's interesting you bring up Greenline because Greenline, uh, one of the motivations for developing that material was the fact that the factory was looking at all the wasted raw material when they were making the joints on the clarinets and they had them on the lathes. They were looking at all this, this African blackwood dust on the floor. And so Buffet Crampon looked at this and said, how can we minimize the waste of this material and provide uh, another option for our customers and our players? So Greenline was born. Uh, in addition to that, though, uh, Buffet Crampon has been at the forefront of uh, replanting uh, impingo trees, which is the tree in, uh, in Africa that provides the African blackwood, the grenadilla wood, for not only clarinets, but oboes and other wind instruments as well. So really, Buffet Crampon has been at the forefront of replenishing those supplies because African blackwood for a while was over harvested and we, we got to a point where we had a shortage of African blackwood and uh, the company has been very active in, in taking steps to make sure that that's not a problem in 100 years for, for the next generation or two generations of players. Two more quick, uh, quick questions from the audience. Uh, before we need to wrap it up. Question about the bore size on the E11 being, uh, how does the bore size compare to the E12 and the R13? And then uh, secondarily, is there a, a B flat, E flat option for the E12 or the E11? Oh, great question. So the, the E11 bore again is gonna be derived from the polycylindrical bore. Uh, it's very similar to what you're gonna find on the E12F or the E13 or even the Giardinelli clarinet. Uh, a little bit larger than what you're gonna find on the R13. I don't have the specific specs. I think it's 14.64 millimeters or something like that. So it's gonna be a little less resistant. Uh, as a result of that, the instruments that have that slightly larger bore uh, are gonna have a 65 millimeter barrel instead of the 66 millimeter barrel that you're gonna find on the R13 B flat clarinet. So uh, very similar bore design to what you're gonna find on the E12F. Uh, as far as I, I believe it was the E flat option on, so uh, there is an E flat version of the E11 clarinet. Uh, it's an African blackwood instrument. And it actually has silver plated keys unlike the B flat that has nickel plated keys. The E11 E flat clarinet is a fantastic option for players and for music education programs that maybe don't have the budget to put into a professional E-flat clarinet. They're able to still get a quality E-flat clarinet so they can do the advanced wind band literature, they can do clarinet choir literature, uh, really a great option and a really affordable price on those instruments. Uh, right now, the E-12F is offered only as a B-flat clarinet right now. Matt, for parents concerned about that, that first wood clarinet and their, their student um, being able to properly maintain that, obviously there's some sort of warranty protection uh, that Buffet does offer. Can you talk to us just a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, we realize that, that because this is a porous material, uh, I, Kurt, I, I laugh with customers and, and they laugh when I tell them this, but it's the truth. The clarinet is learning how to be a clarinet. It, when, when this tree grew into the, the tree that was harvested for the clarinet, it was not designed to be this instrument. So the instrument is learning how to be a clarinet uh, because it is a porous material that changes as it's heated up and cooled off and, and moisture is blown through it. There will occasionally be issues to where you might have a surface crack or a crack on the inner bore. Um, in those cases within the warranty period, and it varies from model to model, 
Uh, of course, we will work with our customers on that. Um, if there is a problem with a crack, you go to your music and arts location and you work with them. They work with us as far as filing a warranty claim, and then we get you squared away. Yeah, very good. An important peace of mind when it comes to that first wood stuff of clarinet. Absolutely. So Matt, I'd like to I'd like to thank you for joining us today. This was just amazing, and this uh, showcase on buffet clarinets. I think everybody will agree that uh, these are some unbelievable instrument and instruments, and it's no surprise that as you mentioned, they're played by more than eighty percent of the world's professional clarinet players. It's just an absolutely unbelievable statistic, um, and an excellent choice for all levels of players. Whether whether you're that advancing student, that high school student, that college student, or of course, a top uh, top professional player. Uh, during this Upgrade Your Sound Showcase, we've got a couple of special offers going on during this period. Uh, we have 48 month financing. This is the first time uh, that Music and Arts has been able to offer 48 month financing. You can get this special financing at any Music and Arts store or online uh, through Wilbur and Brasswin. Uh, you'll receive some details uh, follow up via email, or you can visit uh, Wilbur and Brassman directly online to learn more. You can choose the financing option, or we also have some special uh, special savings options, 15% uh, off instruments over $199. Uh, that'll run through the end of the month. And Buffet uh, on the R13 is actually offering an instant savings uh, through the rest of the year of $250. Again, you can learn more at your local music and arts store. Uh, if you have more questions, this uh, showcase, this woodwind uh, showcase runs through the weekend in music and art stores and online where you can visit your store, speak with an expert, uh, learn more about the clarinets, the lessons, uh, the repair services that we offer. So thanks again for joining this showcase. And Matt, thank you very much for your uh, participation. And uh, thanks again for taking the time to talk about buffet clarinets. Thank you, Kurt. I hope everybody has a great evening and thanks for tuning in.